parts I think about reading books by scientists is that you're given their specific perspective. You're given it's almost like you're living inside their brain for you know the brief 300 or 400 pages that you're reading. And I really, really liked that. And that certainly was the case with this book by Nessa Carey called Junk DNA. I really can't say much more to praise this book. It's, it's, it's an amazing read. I loved it to death. Uh, learned so many cool things and interesting things about it. You know, uh, I think in the book she writes about some really, really interesting things. For example, about aneuploidy in human brain cells, about endogenous retroviruses being reactivated through immunosuppressed mice, and then about people who get uh, heart valve transplants receiving, uh, actually being infected by pig endogenous retroviruses that were being reactivated because of the immunosuppressive drugs that they were taking. And it is a, a bunch of really interesting stories, a bunch of really interesting scenarios that really stress um, the, the points that she was trying to make. And that's the thing that makes reading so awesome is that when you read a book, the quality of information that you're getting isn't very good, but the, or sorry, the quantity of information that you're getting isn't very good, but the quality is. And I think that, that was certainly the case with this book. Um, another thing that I think that's really important just in general terms for reading books written by scientists is that when you get higher up into your education, when you start working on your master's, your PhD, or if you go to medical school or whatever it is that you're doing, all of the information that you're given for this is extremely overwhelming, right? You're given an ass load of, of pa papers you have to read. You're given an ass load of books you have to read. Um, most of which are textbooks, which is just raw information. I think I talked to a friend of mine in medical school that he said that like he spends literally from, from 7 a.m. to like uh, 2, 2 a.m. just working on stuff, trying to read all this stuff. And, and that's a lot of information. And you're not going to be successful, I think, in, in, in understanding that information thoroughly if you don't have a conceptual framework underlying it. And the problem is, is that pedagogically speaking, textbooks are great at giving you information, but textbooks do not give you an underlying conceptual framework. Reading books by scientists, scientists and science writers has given me a conceptual framework. That's just what I can say for me. I can't really speak for other people. Um, but yeah, so this book, Nessa Carey's Junk DNA, is an extension of the epigenetics revolution, in my opinion. And it's a very, very good book at stressing uh, conceptual frameworks of, 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 of stressing things that normal people didn't really think about. And a lot of people are, are kind of nitpicky about um, her use of the word junk DNA, I have no problem with her use of it. To quote Shakespeare, what's in a name, really? Um, but it's such an interesting thing to read about, if, especially you know, if you're going into molecular biology or things like that. Certainly is a, is a good book to read before you take those classes. Um, and one of my favorite parts about it is right here, yeah. She talks about you know, like the ENCODE projects and talks about science. And, and, and one of the things that I've started to see, not just in um, biology, but in a lot of other sciences quote unquote, because everything thinks that it's a science. I'm, I'm not kidding about that. I have a friend of mine who gets his, he's studying communications and uh, yeah, communications. And he thinks that that's scientific because it's statistical and that it, that they publish in their journals and things like that. And, and the, the reason for this is, is because of statistics, but it's also, I think is a very relevant um, thing to read about is, is the ENCODE chapter. I don't know what the name of it is, but it's so important because, you know, we're moving into this era of of really big, big, giant amounts of data, big, massive projects. You know, the, the days of, of really solid experimental design is kind of gone away, and we've exchanged that for newer mathematical models and statistical models. And this, this little section here that she talks about really provides a good discussion, a good dialogue about how to approach not just things like ENCODE project, but any type of, of set of big data or something like that. And I just want to read this to you. It says, that the ENCODE data sets were predominantly interpreted by the original authors through the use of statistical and mathematical approaches. The skeptics argue that this leads us down a blind alley because it doesn't take into account biological relationships and that these are critically important. They use a very helpful analogy to explain this. The reason that the heart is important is that it pumps blood around the body. That's the biologically important relationship. But if we analyze the actions of the heart just by a mathematically derived map of its interactions, we would draw some ridiculous conclusions. These conclude that the heart is present so that it can add weight to the body and to produce the sound lub dub. Um, and so I feel like with big data, we're almost like we're going back to this heliocentric model of, of the Earth being the center of the universe and the explanation for how the Earth is the center of the universe revolved around epicycles, which were mathematically sound, but 
very, very complex and, and did not constitute the underlying reality. And I think that that's just something that I've always been irritated by is, you know, people have horrible experimental designs um, and they, they will use statistics, advanced statistics to work on it. Uh, I'm not going to point any names of certain uh, neuroscience or psychology labs that I've heard of where the data gets corrupted, quote unquote, and they have to go in and, and they find something when they publish it. Um, but it was just a, that chapter in her book was a very wonderful discussion about how to deal with big data, how we should think about big data. And I think the ENCODE project is a good example of, of how, to, how we should handle these sort of things. So I definitely enjoyed that. Um, the only cons that I think I had of this was that, you know, when I read The Epigenetics Revolution, it had a narrative to it. You know what I mean? Like it was about this triumph of an idea. And she talks about Thomas Kuhn and, and, and uh, intellectual revolutions that happen and all of this stuff. And it, it was really this, this paradigm shifting moment where we were talking about a new idea conquering an old one and changes being happening and taking places. People like John Gurdon, his, I mean, his story alone was so wonderful. And she didn't really talk about the scientists that made these accomplishments so much as she did just talked about the results. And I know that her publisher, I think, made her kind of dumb down um, the, the information and the, the, the diction that she was using, I think, to appeal to a larger audience. But I personally don't like that because I think the most of her audience are science-oriented people, at least to some extent. And one of the hardest things about being a science writer is that your audience is constantly getting smarter and smarter and, and more and more informed about these things. But, I mean, it, it just it didn't have that, that, that feel to it of a story like the epigenetics revolution. I really think that honestly, she probably could have put both the epigenetics revolution and junk DNA into just one big book um, together. But I, I think it, you know, it's kind of taxing. I mean, people are liking, I think now on the subject just of, of reading books, people like books that are usually 200 to 300 uh, to 400 pages, nothing more than that. And I think if she combined the two, it would have been too long. But there's nothing about this book that I think stands alone. It really just reads as an extension to Epigenetics Revolution. So if you're Googling the book right now, if you're thinking, should I read this book? I would really recommend reading the Epigenetics Revolution firsthand um, because I think that that lays down a, a better conceptual framework than Junk DNA does. But nevertheless, I really, really love the book. I didn't see anything wrong with it um, except for this one page here on page 203 where she's talking about this um, Dutch family that had this mutation where they had extra fingers and it says right here, um, all 96 affected individuals had a change of just one base in their junk DNA. Instead of a C, these patients had a G, and none of the relatives with the normal number of digits had a C in this position. I don't understand that. It says instead of a C, instead of a C, meaning like a C is normal, the patients had a G. And none of the relatives with the normal numbers had a C in this position. So in the first sentence, she says that C is for the norm, and in the second sentence, she says that it's not. I, maybe I just read that wrong. Maybe I was stupid about it. Maybe it was a typo. I don't know. But that was the only part of the book that I read that I was just like, what is she talking about? And that really kind of threw me off. So overall, I gave it an 8 out of 10. It's a very, very good book, and I would highly recommend it to anyone who has not taken a developmental biology class or a molecular biology class. It will make you think. It'll make you, you know, approaches some very important topics that are going to become very, very relevant in the future. Um, it's just the thing that I didn't like about it was that it, it didn't have a narrative to it. It didn't, it didn't um, talk about the scientists themselves and the thoughts, the process that they went through. It was really just, um, it, was, it was really almost like the way that I would want a textbook to be written. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I certainly loved it, but I think I could understand why people wouldn't like it. So it wasn't as good as the epigenetics revolution, but it's still very, very good.